Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. We're excited to uh, be doing a couple of things today. Uh, first and foremost, we're obviously going to be holding a webinar. <laughs> and today's focus and topic um, is all about safe outdoor education trips. And some of you may call them uh, experiential education. Others may call them outdoor ed. Some of you might just call them Knowles trips. Um, but whatever you call them, a lot of our schools have these outdoor uh, opportunities and their field trips essentially uh, to a place that's somewhere different, not quite as urban perhaps as your normal field trips and a little bit further away. And these trips are excellent and one of the things that's always interesting is that if you spend all of your time talking to your attorney or to your safety consultant, um, you probably wouldn't do these outdoor ed trips at all. Uh, but you don't spend all of your time talking to us. Instead, you spend a good chunk of your time talking to your kids and talking to their families and talking to others at your school. And so you are going to do these outdoor ed trips. And so our job is to make them as safe as we possibly can. Now, for schools that we work with, we do everything from the emergency planning process for these trips all the way up to staff training while they're on the trips. And for some schools, we even actually will accompany them on the trips. Um, have either an EMT or a nurse go with you on the trip so that if something does go wrong that there's somebody there from, that can actually respond to it and help manage it from a medical perspective. Um, now, that doesn't mean that it's necessary per se, uh, but for some of these trips it really does make a lot of good sense. Uh, for example, we have a school that does take a trip every year to somewhere in South America and it rotates every year. So one year it was in Chile, another year it was uh, I forget exactly where, somewhere else. Um, and given the access to medical care, not only in the area, but also in the rural part of the country that they were actually visiting, it made a lot of sense for us to have somebody accompany them. And in the end, it was actually a really good idea. Um, we do that for local trips too, trips to Joshua Tree or San Francisco or whatever the case may be. Um, and on each of these trips that we've accompanied, our schools on, we've learned some things, um, not just about the medical engagement or sort of medical response, but also just on how you can set yourself up to have a really safe trip. And so today's webinar is going to share uh, some of those things that we've learned and give you an opportunity to uh, hopefully grab some of these ideas and actually begin to use them on your own trips. Obviously, if you don't have the resources or the capacity to uh, have an outdoor ed program, um, you're still probably taking some form of field trip, uh, whether that's just down the street to a museum or maybe to a local college. Um, and so I, su I suspect that there will be parts of this webinar that you can apply to those trips. But I also want to let you know that we will be doing a second webinar a little bit later this year that will be focused on what I'll call regular field trips. So field trips to a regular or normal urban place. Um, that don't have some of the complications of hard access to medical care or needing to deal with some things in the wilderness, um, things like that. All of that said, um, with me today is Yavidia, who will be actually leading us through this webinar. And as always, we invite you to ask questions and contribute ideas. Uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a chat panel. You might also notice that today's webinar is back on our old system, GoToWebinar. And that will be the webinar system that we use moving forward. Uh, what we learned is Webinar Jam, which was the system that we've used for the last four months or so, um, is really great uh, for us as uh, webinar leaders. It's even better for you as webinar participants. Um, but the technology involved doesn't always work. Um, and unfortunately, because of the number of people that we have on each of these webinars, we just can't have those types of things. So we have made the switch back to go to webinar. Uh, you will need to auto-enroll or auto-resubscribe if you're somebody who's been enrolled in the Webinar Jam subscription. Um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then it probably doesn't apply to you. Um, but if you do, uh, there's a, 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 an auto-renew or auto-enroll feature that you can sign up for in Webinar Jam where you get automatically registered for each of the webinars that we do. And so if you have been somebody who's participated in that in the past, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And we also want to invite you to do the same in GoToWebinar. So you'll see that in the follow-up email that comes out, as well as uh, moving forward, you'll see that in the email that goes out before the webinars that generally comes out on Monday mornings. All of that having been said, um, let's jump in. Let's talk a little bit about what Outdoor Ed looks like. And man, I could have rhymed if I just did that a little bit better. Um, 
Yadidia, I'd like to welcome you and invite you to share with us all that you can about outdoor ed and how to make it safe. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for everyone who's joining us today. Um, this is going to be kind of an outside um, webinar. It's going to be really interesting. It's going to be a journey. Um, and thank you also to anyone who's going to watch this afterwards on our YouTube channel. Um, if anyone is listening and didn't know this, we have a YouTube channel that has a bunch of webinars. Every webinar that we do, we put on our YouTube channel, and it's a really great resource. I recommend everyone watch every webinar we've ever done, or just the ones I've done. That's all I really care about. Um, but it's a good resource, and I think people should check it out. We're talking about outdoor education today, and we're going to talk a bit about um, field trips and a bit about supervision as well. But Right now, it's going to be mostly for like the outdoor type. So let us jump in. If it goes. Um, so just an overview. We're going to talk about kind of a brief description of what an outdoor education is. And you'll learn outdoor education covers a huge variety of different things. We're going to talk about risk and risk assessment. And that's really going to be the meat of this um, and talking about acceptable levels of risk and how we can mitigate risk and danger. We're going to talk about supervision requirements and that's where we're going to get into kind of a bit of things that are going to be true for any field trip that we go on. And then I'll talk a bit about wilderness preparedness. Um, so what is an outdoor education? Learning experience outside of the classroom. So it's anything that really takes you out of the classroom, out of the school building. And uh, this covers a huge, huge amount of things. And, you know, we can see the uh, preschool class over here going outdoor just to the garden outside the school. Or, you know, going on trip, a multi-day trip to the Grand Canyon. So it really covers a lot of things. We also see a lot of schools that do kind of a ropes course or challenge course. They're really great activities. Part of the point of outdoor education is it's learning through experience. Um, we all know that kids and everyone else can only stomach so much of sitting in a classroom and, you know, listening to someone lecture. And outdoor education really gets to change that up. It brings the students outside, um, really using their hands. If it's a nature-themed thing, really looking at the nature and the biology of everything around us. A lot of times that outdoor education is also about team building. It's putting people into group scenarios where they really haven't had to function in those kind of roles before while they're just sitting in the classroom. But once you get them onto a ropes course, all of a sudden, you know, talking with each other, trusting each other, that really becomes a big thing. One of the really big pros of outdoor education is we all know, especially everyone in education, we all know that there are people who don't learn well in a strict classroom setting, and I'm one of those people. I I can't sit still for long enough. I need to keep things moving. I need to kind of bounce around, and outdoor education is such a great environment for those kind of learners. Um, but leaving the classroom is a scary thing. We're comfortable with the classroom. We have done everything we can to control risk and danger in the classroom. So leaving that safety zone, that can be a scary thing. So what is risk? Um, it's a board game, apparently. Um, a lot of the times when we talk about risk, and Chris alluded to this, is that we try to eliminate all risk. And we talk about risk as, you know, any amount of risk is bad. We don't want risk. Get rid of risk. Um, and kind of we get to the point where risk becomes synonymous with danger and harm. And that's not really the case. Because here's the thing. We do live with risk all the time. Risk is more about where are the potentials for harm. But also, where are the potentials for learning? You can talk about risk in a positive sense as well as a negative sense. So we live with risk every day. We never completely eliminate risk. 
but we get to a point where we are at a acceptable level of risk. And so one of the examples I talk about is we drive. Driving anywhere, anytime you get into a moving vehicle, it is probably one of the riskiest things you will ever do in your life. And I have this statistic up here from the CDC. Um, about 30,000 people die every year from motor vehicle deaths. Um, it's one of easily one of the top 10 um, causes of death in the country, um, or I think preventable death is uh, the term. Um, and so, you know, every time we get in a car, we invite risk in. And you can be the safest driver in the world, and some other pr driver just isn't. And it's the other driver that causes you harm. But we accept the risk inherent in driving a car because we also accept that we need their help. We need to be able to get here and there. So what is risk? Um, I have this equation here. This is, you know, the official definition. Risk is probability times severity. So it's how likely is something to happen and how big of a problem is it? Um, and so I have some examples here that we'll talk about. So spontaneous human combustion, cuts and bruises, and allergic reaction. And for each of these, we can um, look at it and say, okay, the, you know, what is the level of risk inherent in each of these things? How, how much are we at risk of this? Um, when we are in a classroom, we are much less, uh, it's a lower level of risk for cuts and bruises than if we go outside. Um, so again, we have these things that we want to avoid, but we also have to recognize we can't completely eliminate risk. And so what we need to do is find what is an acceptable level of risk, and if it's not at an acceptable level of risk, how do we get it to that acceptable level? Um, so we have two different approaches. We can lower how dangerous a um, scenario is. We can try and implement. Uh, we can try to lower the probability or the severity of something happening, or we can implement safety measures, and I should say, and or. So let's go back to this. Um, risk equals probability times severity. So spontaneous human combustion, really, 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 really severe. Someone who spontaneously catches fire dies. Um, but there's a zero probability of that happening. There's no such thing as spontaneous human combustion. So no matter what we do, the level of risk for spontaneous human combustion is zero because probability is zero. So we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to write protocols for it. We don't have to implement safety measures. But let's talk about cuts and bruises. There's a high, high probability risk. Like kids fall, kids get cuts and bruises. It happens, but it's really not a big deal. And for just cuts and bruises, we don't want to control kids, especially younger kids who need to be active. We don't want to control them so much for a fear of cuts and bruises because it's such a low severity. It's such a low risk. So what we're going to do is we can just implement some safety measures. We can put, um, we can have band-aids, we can have antibiotic or neosporin cream. Low risk, we can just be happy with just the safety measures. But let's talk about allergic reactions, because that is something that has a decent probability of happening. Kids have allergies, and if they're exposed to a common food allergy, then, yeah, they might be, um, get, you know, that's a pretty common thing to, that can happen. It's pretty likely to happen. And severity. Um, people with allergic reactions, allergic reactions are oftentimes very, very severe emergencies. So we're going to both uh, limit the exposure, so we're going to lower the possible dangers, and we're going to implement safety measures. So to uh, lower the probability, we're going to limit exposure to allergens. So that would be something like establishing a nut-free table or a nut-free school. 
we could also implement safety measures. So we can have people carrying epinephrine auto injectors. Um, I, I refuse to say EpiPen because EpiPen is actually a brand name. There are other epinephrine auto injectors out there. Now you know. Um, so for allergic reactions, we can say this is actually a pretty intense risk. So we need to both lower the probability and implement safety measures. So when we move to outdoor education, whenever we think about what we're going to do for this adventure, we have to assess what kind of risks are involved. And when we do the risks, we can look at, you know, anything that could happen, like a bear attack or possible uh, waterfront emergencies. We have to look at it and say, okay, you know, here's the probability, here's the severity, we need to make sure that it's balanced and we need to make sure that it is an acceptable level of risk. And if it's um, not an acceptable level of risk, we need to address it. One of the big things that we we're going to talk about to make any scenario less scary is proper supervision. This is important for outdoor education. It is important for any field trip. It's important during the day. You wouldn't leave a group of children unattended. You wouldn't try to have one adult with a hundred students. It's just not a safe thing. So that's why supervision is one of our first lines of defenses for dealing with risk and safety. In general, what we recommend is that you have a 2 to 10 chaperone to student ratio. This is uh, lower than most recommendations. Most recommendations you'll see is 1 to 10. The reason why we recommend 2 to 10 is because you can never leave uh, the students unattended. What we have seen happen in the past, and you know this actually did happen and um, really tragic outcomes, um, there will be one adult with a group of five, a group of ten students, and one of those kids forgot something. One of those kids needs to be escorted to the bathroom, something like that. And so the adult will leave with that one student and then leave the rest of the group behind. We never, ever want that to happen because all of a sudden you've left people behind. So if there's only one chaperone with this group, then that one chaperone has to decide, all right, do I escort the kid to the bathroom or do I, do I escort them to the bathroom and leave the group unattended? Or do I stay with the group and leave someone to go to the bathroom by themselves? Or do I bring the entire group to the bathroom? So you never want to have to enter into that discussion. So that's why we always recommend at least 2 to 10. You always want to maintain line of sight. And when we get to um, when we get to talking about field trips in a larger uh, environment, we're going to talk about um, line of sight differently. But for right now, what I'd say is all students should be kept within line of sight at all times. Um, I was advised to include this line when we're on hikes. Um, a lot of times what happens, we just kind of form a single file line and quicker people are in front, slower people or more distracted people are in back. It is important that there is at least an adult in front and in back. So all the students should be sandwiched between those two adults. You should never have a student or a child who is not within those two. So that way they can't go too far up ahead and they can't fall behind. And obviously you should space out the rest of your chaperone throughout the group just to keep an eye on the kids. Um, you want to make sure that there's sufficient training. This is really going to depend on what you are doing, where you are going, and what kind of challenges and risks you're going to face. But if you are going to face some risks, you really need to make sure that you are um, addressing them. And make you know if you are going to a waterfront property, make sure that you have staff who are trained as lifeguards and trained to be uh, dealing with waterfronts. Um, make sure you are gender balanced. This is uh, especially important for overnight uh, adventures. 
if you have majority male population, you shouldn't have a majority female uh, chaperones. And, I mean, obviously there's some balance, and it's okay, you know, if it's not exactly uh, an even ratio, but you do need to make sure that you have enough of each gender um, to reflect the student population so that you never have, you know, bathroom issues, you never have issues about, um, you know, who, which adult or which chaperones are going to sleep in the male area. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Another thing is check with your destination. Um, and sorry that my computer is making some noises right now. Um, you want to check with your jet destination and make sure that everything is exactly how you um, manage it. And also make sure what level of um, supervision is already inherent at that location. For instance, if you are going to um, like kind of a week-long camp, with your kids, then they probably have their own staff and their own um, people working there, but also they'll tell you, okay, we need, you know, you're bringing 40 students, well, we need four adults available at all time from you guys. So check with them, check what their capabilities are. One big thing is if you're doing any kind of water activity, you need to check in with them that they have uh, lifeguards and appropriately trained lifeguards. For instance, a lot of hotels have pools, but they do not have lifeguards. So that is important to check. The other thing you need to do is you need to alter this level of supervision for what you're doing. There will be some trips where you two to ten is not enough and you really need more chaperones because this is a high risk environment and you need that level of training or you need that level of, uh, you know, supervision. You need more training. So make sure that you really plan out what you're doing. Make sure that everything is planned accordingly. We're also going to talk about wilderness preparedness. Um, you want to make sure that students and chaperones understand the risk and responsibilities. This is a great, great learning opportunity. You want to make sure that students feel like they are part of the discussion on safety. The idea being is that whenever we leave the classroom, they are going to do things that um, almost puts them at risk. Um, you know, when we go on a hike, they need to know, stick to the path, stay with the group. If you get lost, this is what you need to do. Safety needs to incorporate students in a way that is much more significant than in our normal operations. In our normal operations, we really focus our safety planning on staff and faculty. You know, they're the ones who are taking care of everyone else. They're the ones who are going to be in the emergency plan. And usually, as soon as anything happens, okay, you know, all the students go over to this one area and we will supervise the students from there well. Uh, the staff and faculty assemble in emergency teams and do kind of everything else. That's not the case when we're out in the wilderness. Students really need to um, have a front row seat to how to be safe. Um, and, you know, if they're on an obstacle course, if they're on a ropes course, they need to be following the rules and they need to play their part. Um, you can't have a student who is just going to mess around at a ropes course. That's just a dangerous scenario. So they need to know this. And if you are doing overnight things, anytime you go outside, you need to um, really ensure that the rules are laid out to the students and the expectations. And they need to make sure that um, they follow that and that they understand the importance. You want to make sure that you have additional first aid supplies and training. This is especially true in wilderness. Um, when we talk about wilderness, you can be out there. A lot of times I'll talk to schools and they say, well, you know, we don't really need to prepare for emergency because an ambulance is, you know, 10 to 15 minutes away, tops. 
Which is true. It's never the best answer to hear. It's not what I really like to hear. But it, it's a bit true, you know, especially if you're in the city. There are resources around you. If you are out on a hike, you do not have readily available resources. You don't. So you really need to make sure that you are in position to take care of someone if something happens out in the wilderness, um, even if it's not that far from the city. So you really need to make sure that you have sufficient first aid supplies and that people are trained. Um, this is not a scenario when you have one person who one time took a first aid class. You really want to make sure you have um, several people who know what they're doing. You need to keep a constant watch on what's going on. And all parts of the adventure, especially the weather, but, you know, how are things going? How are supplies? How are the students? How are the staff and faculty? How is the program that we're working with? Um, you need to change your plan. You need to say, okay, you know, we were planning on doing this, but given the scenario, we need to do that. You also need to mentally prepare yourself to call it and say, you know what? We got out here, just wasn't happening. And I'll give you an example. There's one time I was um, on a trip in a desert and um, it, was, it was supposed to be a three-day uh, hike, and we were going to hike during the day and kind of rest at night, but it was so hot that there was a hiking ban put into place, and so we were not allowed to do our expected program. What we ended up doing is we chilled um, during the day. We just kind of sat around in a nice, cool area by a uh, small little pond, we did a bit of a night hike because by the nighttime it had cooled off to where we were allowed to hike. But the following morning we headed back home because we were not allowed to continue on that desert hike because it had gotten so hot. So you need to be ready to change your plans and to say, you know what, can't do it this time, maybe next. You also need to have a plan. Anytime you go on a field trip, you need to have a plan of certain things. So what happens if someone has an emergency plan? And you can basically take the at-a-glance posters that we make, which cover some of the largest uh, types of emergencies that you're going to encounter, and you can do that and say, okay, you know, if this happens, how are we going to address it? Um, one of the big things is if someone has a medical emergency, what are you going to do? And this really depends on where you're going. If you're just going outdoors like to the garden outside your school, you don't need to worry about this so much. But if you really go on a hike, really go outside, where's the closest hospital? How are you getting there? Um, you know, do you have cell service? And can you call an ambulance if you need to? There's one event that Joffe Emergency Services was working where we knew that the campgrounds didn't have good cell service. And by that, I mean it didn't have any cell service. So we actually invested in a satellite phone. And if we needed to call an ambulance for ourselves or one of our attendees, um, we had a satellite phone. And also, by the way, satellite phones, you can't call 911 from a satellite phone. You need to know the 10-digit phone number for the local or county uh, 911 service. So again, you really need to have those plans. Um, and, you know, everything from if we have to call an ambulance, how do we go about doing that, to if there's inclement weather, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? How are we going to keep everyone safe? You really need to have all that planned out ahead of time. Again, with wilderness preparedness, you really need to talk to students. Um, it, it's a huge part is that students need to know what's going on. With first aid, um, there is an institute called the National Outdoor Leadership School. They, Knowles does um, outdoor education. They have several different programs that happen throughout the year. I don't know. They might be able to just want, run one specifically for you. I don't think they do that. Um, but they're a really cool organization, and they're kind of the name in outdoor education. 
they're also the name in wilderness uh, medicine. They have the Wilderness Medicine Institute. They do wilderness first aid courses. They do courses where if you already have first aid, they'll just kind of give you the bonus things. They have wilderness EMT, which is actually something I've really thought about doing. The point of wilderness add-on is what I was talking about earlier. First aid, the way we teach it is stabilize someone till an ambulance shows up. When you're in the wilderness, that's not happening. It's not happening for a while. So you might have to split that elbow and walk down the side of the hill. You might have to do the best you can. And, you know, the search and rescue team is three hours out, four hours out. So that's what wilderness training does. If you are serious about doing an outdoor education um, and really doing these kind of long activities and these outdoor activities, I highly recommend having at least one person who has that wilderness bonus. Um, you should also check if you are going with a program, then um, that program should, the if they have uh, staff there, that staff should have wilderness first aid. It's called uh, WUFA, by the way. Um, again, you want to make sure that you're bringing extra equipment, especially wound care, because that's really what you're going to see a lot of in the wilderness. Um, also make sure that you have water, food, and bug repellent. If you are outside on beach, sunscreen. Um, those three things, really, four things, are really, really important. Um, make sure that you have a plan for water. Make sure you have enough water. Like hiking outside where it might be really hot, that is going to take water. If you are underhydrated, you will get sick. Make sure you have enough of it. Make sure that you have a thought for, you know, if we need more, how do I get more? And then this is kind of going back to knowing how to reassess the situation and um, when to call it. And then we're going to go back to the example of driving. There were several times when you were going to say, you know what, I'm not going to get in my car right now. It might be that there are traffic delays, and you're monitoring and you say, wow, traffic is really bad. It's going to be really crowded. There's going to be a lot of, you know, really tight maneuvers. I'm just going to wait the traffic out. It'll be better. It'll be safer if I just wait an extra hour. <coughs> um, same thing with inclement or dangerous weather. If it's inclement weather, we drive differently. In the rain we and snow, we drive slower. We allow for greater stop distance. We understand that there's going to be reduced visibility. We make sure our windshield wipers are on. We make sure our headlights are on. So we do all these things to make it safer. But a lot of times we'll still drive through inclement weather. Dangerous weather, we might say, you know, no. If there's a tornado warning going on, we're not going to drive through that. We're going to pull over into a motel or something like that and wait it out. Um, sickness or injury, you know, if we, you know, it, if we're sick, we probably can't drive. If someone has food poisoning and they can't leave the bathroom because they're just throwing up from food poisoning, they can't drive. They're not going to try to drive. Um, and so that's another example of when you would be able to say, it's like, you know what? I'm okay with the normal level of risk that is inherent in driving, but right now, this is not a good scenario. This is, we're not doing this. And also equipment failure. If your car is breaking down or, you know, if the seatbelt won't fasten, this would be a time when you say, driving, not now. We'll do it some other time. We'll do it later. So you can understand that there are some times when you would be driving and you see up ahead some really dark clouds and you say, hmm, I better pull over, see what's going on. And you see that tornado warning's going on and you say, you know what? I'm just going to stay pulled over. I'm not going to try to drive through this. And so you can understand that there's a parallel between that and the way you would understand uh, outdoor education when you would just say, you know what? We were hiking. This was our plan. Unfortunately, we just can't do it. It's not safe. 
Um, I already went over this, but um, have a plan. Make sure that you know kind of what you will do in a ton of different uh, scenarios. Make sure that you have a plan for supervision and for going to the hospitals. And, you know, if you have a group of 10 people, 10 kids, and you have two chaperones, and then one kid has to go to the hospital, well, now you're down to one chaperone with nine students. So what are you going to do now? How are you going to change what your plan is? Um, and so just a review before we finish up. Um, what is an outdoor education? What is outdoor ed? Um, that's, again, anything that's going to take you out of the classroom for any period of time, for an hour, for a week, for a summer. Um, and it really challenges what we look at for harm, what safety measures we use, and how we address that. When we do risk and risk assessment, whenever we do a plan, we need to identify different things that could pose risk, could pose harm, and say, okay, you know, this is something that is a danger, and how are we going to address it? So inclement weather, dangerous weather. That is a risk. How probable is that and how severe would it be? What safety mechanisms are in place? What ways can we reduce the likelihood of this happening or reduce the likelihood that this is going to be a problem? We talked a bit about supervision requirements, and again, we're going to talk about that later in um, urban field trips. But make sure that you have enough adults present to really watch the kids because it this is a risky environment. This is a changing environment. So we really need to make sure that we have enough staff available to um, help with the supervision, but also that those staff are prepared and they know what they're doing. We talked about wilderness preparedness, um, and kind of the big tenants there are students need to have some buy-in. They need to um, get have. Um, they need to feel like they're part of the process. We also need to make sure that we have enough uh, supplies, enough training. And so that is it. And that's actually old. Um, and so, as always, we have this complimentary gift. Um, anyone who is not already a client of us, um, feel free to reach, us, reach out to us um, through this link. You can also see in the right-hand side. Um, and... Um, you know, get in touch with us, and we'd love to come to your school do a free safety assessment. You can also email us at schools at joffeemergencyservices.com. You can go to our website, joffeemergencyservices.com. Um, and that is it. So thank you, everyone, for listening to us as we talked about outdoor education, and um, we hope to see you again soon.